Lieutenant General Robert E. Schmidl, Jr. is the Deputy Commander, U.S. Cyber Command. I can't think of a uh, more appropriate start for a conference on joint warfighting, given the acknowledgement of, the, of cyberspace as a warfighting domain, and what we all acknowledge is a rapidly growing threat in the cyberspace. General Schmidl is a naval aviator. Uh, he has uh, flown F-4 and F-A-18 aircraft, has commanded at every level up to the uh, commanding general first Marine Aircraft Wing. He's also had a number of staff assignments that I think uh, give him a, an excellent kind of big picture perspective to, to share with us. He, uh, he was involved intimately in two quadrennial defense reviews, uh, the 2010 uh, review. He was, uh, he was the Marine Corps lead. Uh, he's also been the deputy director in J-8 on the joint staff, and he's been the military secretary for two commandants of the Coast Guard. So I think it would be fair to say that uh, he's got a kind of a global perspective on what's going on in the Department of Defense. He's also incredibly well-educated, both in civilian and military schools, and I guess because he doesn't have enough to do, he's working on his PhD at Georgetown as we speak. So without further ado, Lieutenant General Robert E. Schmidl, Jr. I think I have the right uniform on this morning. Um, the, uh, uh, I, now they've got me mic'd up. Can you hear me okay? I guess they didn't figure I could stand still long enough, so they wanted to put this portable mic on me. Uh, but thank you all very much for, uh, for the opportunity to, to speak to you this morning. What I'm going to talk to you about is uh, what Cyber Command is doing today, what Cyber Command views as the as sort of the way forward in cyberspace and, and how we sort of view the, the operational domain of cyberspace and, uh, and some of the challenges that are there, that are therein, and how we would intend to, uh, to address those challenges. So uh, without, uh, I think we'll go ahead and, uh, they, they tell me there's a pedal up here to change these slides, but that's like a lot of moving parts this morning, so I'm probably just gonna say next slide if you all don't mind. So to, to, uh, to, to uh, uh, continue on with, uh, with the introduction, you know, joint warfare, cyberspace really, really is that way, and it's that way for a number of reasons. First of all, we don't have, we, the, the, the United States writ large, none of the services have the capacity that we need in order to be able to do the things that we're trying to do in cyberspace, nor do we have the skill sets that are required. So as, as we in Cyber Command are joining our components together, and we have four components uh, from each of the, uh, each of the four services, uh, or, the, uh, or the, the four services, and we also have a Coast Guard component, which we're standing up, we take all of those folks together, and as we start to, to do things, to do operational planning, to do the defense of our networks, to do the operations of our networks, it's very, very difficult for any one organization to have all the capacity that they need to do that, so inherently, it is that way. It, it is joint. The other part of this is the scope of what we do. You know, the, the, the scope and scale of, of what goes on in, in, uh, in the world of cyber is something that, that still, uh, is, uh, is a, it still fascinates me just how much, uh, how much of, a, uh, of a, a view we have of the world, as it were. You know, I came here last August, and uh, it's, it's, quite, it's a bit different than, than operating in a, in a uh, running, for instance, an air wing and flying fighters. But it's, it's, it's operationally, it, it's kind of going in the same direction, and we are trying to operationalize, if you will, the space that is in cyberspace. The last thing you see on there that talks about authorities is uh, the, the there, there is no single organization amongst our services that has all of the authorities that they would require because the authorities that we get generally aren't something that is, in, that is intrinsic to, a, to any particular organization. The authorities are either in terms of policy or in terms of legislation, and they cover the whole gamut of things that we do in Cyber Command, in this joint command. So, 
So the notion that you could take and have, you know, kind of a, an individual service effort in, in, cyber, in cyberspace is one that, that, that is not particularly compelling, which is not to say that the services don't have unique capabilities and unique training focuses in what they do and that they have to train and equip in their Title X mission, the, the forces that we need in, uh, uh, for cyberspace, but uh, to operate in cyber. But effectively, it's, it is a very joint uh, by its by its nature, there's just no other way to to to, to riddle it uh, in any other way but that. So, if you go to the next slide, please. So, I thought that since I was coming down here today, and you wanted me to talk about, uh, or that the theme of this was joint and coalition warfare, I thought I'd talk for a little bit about coalition warfare as well. And Scott, hit the next slide. See if the Afghanistan comes back on this thing. Ah, there it goes. Okay, so. Coalition networks are, in, in my opinion, the way we are moving. Um, the, and that's because the combatant commanders, the geographical combatant commanders, are demanding that. That's the way they're fighting wars these days. We're not fighting them as, as, as a single, uh, as a single uh, country. We're fighting them in part of a coalition. So if you're going to have a coalition, you're going to have coalition networks. And so the challenges with doing that, of course, are that uh, A, that they're compatible in terms of the kinds of technology that you're using, that also that they are compatible in terms of the security framework and the architecture for those, uh, for those networks. And, and that can, quite frankly, can be quite challenging. So, you know, the network start is, shows you on one side of the slide from the sort of the traditional Five Eyes relationships that we have to expand to NATO, and then from there to the Afghan Mission Network, where there's some 27 countries that are part of that network. So the, the question becomes, how do we architect those networks so that they can be inclusive, so that they can support what the combatant commanders need in terms of information sharing, and also in terms of the security that, that needs to be inherent in those things? And I would suggest that one of the ways that you might think about doing that is, is that if you're going to join a coalition network, as part of that network, that there are some uh, that there are some um, sort of business rules. There's some behaviors that are expected of the people that belong to that network, and in exchange for that, for 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 having that uh, uh, or for abiding by those sort of principles, you would be, have access to the information sharing that is available in that network. And as you can see on the slide here, you know we talk about this common operational environment, about the, the notion of early warning, but, but more about the, the cooperation in both intelligence and technology, which we just mentioned, and in doctrinal development. And that's one of the areas that I think really is, uh, is some place that we not spend as much attention on as, as, uh, as we are going to in the future, which is the development of joint, of joint and coalition doctrine to govern how we're going to operate in cyberspace. So clearly we're heading towards more coalition networks. We have, again, the Afghan Mission Network that stood up now, and, and the other regional combatant commanders are also talking about doing the same thing. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a challenge that, that awaits us out there, and again, it's not just technological, it's cultural, and, it's, uh, and, uh, and it has to do with, uh, with the security of those networks as well. If you go to the next slide, Scott. Try the next one, see what happens. So I just wanted to tell you just for a minute about how we got here, how Cyber Command got here. So again, you know, we sort of set the stage that cyberspace and operating in cyberspace truly is a joint uh, evolution. It truly is joint operations, and more accurately, it's coalition operations. So Cyber Command, is, uh, as those of you that I'm sure have read uh, Secretary Lin's article, it was in Foreign Affairs, he talked about the, the discovery in 2008 of malware uh, in some of our networks to include some of our classified networks. So it was in the response to that, uh, to that evolution that was called Buckshot Yankee that, that it became apparent that we had the defense and the, and the offense, if you will, uh, to, to simplify it, in separate places. Not only separate places geographically, but in separate organizations and in separate entities. And one of the things that, that, uh, that we think could have made our reaction to that evolution even more uh, timely is if we had those two things together. You know, you wouldn't think to walk into a, for instance, into a brigade level uh, talk, let's say, and find that the guys doing offense are over on this side of the tent and the folks doing defense are either in that side of the tent or in another tent altogether. It just would never occur to you to do things that way. So I think that as we looked at how we were going to operate in cyberspace, that was sort of the genesis for Cyber Command. 
We are a sub-unified command under STRATCOM, Strategic Command, and uh, we have a uh, General Keith Alexander, a four-star general, is the, is the commander of Cyber Command. We have three, as you can see on there, three main lines of operations, the, the things that we do day to day. We, we operate the GIG, the Global Information Grid. We defend it, and we are prepared to conduct offensive operations if the, uh, if the president so, uh, so desires. So day to day, we spend a lot of our time on the first two of these things. We spend a lot of time sort of managing the, the gig and, and operating the gig, controlling the bandwidth and things that have to do with the gig, and, and realize that the global information grid is just the dot mil domain, the dot mil networks. That's, that's the only place that Cybercom has any authorities to operate. And in terms of defending, you know, the line between the defense and the offensive piece is, uh, is, is actually pretty thin. And, uh, you know, Vince Lombardi probably had it closer to right than, uh, than, than, we, than we may have realized at the time. So we'll talk a little bit more about the defense later on, but that's just sort of, I just wanted to set the stage for you about what Cybercom is. We're at, we're, we are headquartered at Fort Meade, Maryland. Uh, we are co-located up there with NSA. And because of the, the technological things and the queuing, and the cryptologic enterprise that NSA has that enables Cyber Command to do its mission. It, they're really inextricably uh, tied together. So, next slide, please. So, how did we get to where we are in terms of the threat? So, back in the early to mid 90s, when the internet begins to, to, to really to come alive here, the biggest thing that we see at that point is exploitation in terms of the threat. We see people that are, that are into networks that are exploiting information, that, that are downloading files and, and pulling uh, data, not just from the United States government, but from, from everywhere, quite frankly, from uh, ranging from commercial enterprises, as I'm sure most of you are well aware, to clear defense contractors, to just across the board. The threat, as it evolves into the late 90s and early into the 2000 phase, we begin in, in the, into the, this century, we begin to see more disruption. We begin to see things that are denial of service attacks. So the, the threat has sort of evolved from kind of getting in there and just downloading things now to actually to, to dis actively disrupting things, whether they're denial of service disruptions uh, or whether they're disruptions of another kind in, in some way, shape, or form of the, of the, the workings of the Internet. Well, the last thing that we are seeing now is, uh, is perhaps the, uh, I, I would suppose probably the most disturbing thing, is that we are seeing the beginnings of the development of destructive tools that, that uh, of, of software, if you will, that has no purpose except to cause destruction of databases or physical destruction. And so that's, that's the, the sort of the dangerous trend, if you will, in the way the threat has, uh, has evolved. Now, it's not to say, that there's not a lot of exploitation going on today. There is, there's a tremendous amount of exploitation. There are other uh, folks in the world that are very, very active in the networks that, uh, that are here in the United States and that are part of not only the government but other places and in attempting to exfiltrate information. So, But that's kind of the way we've seen this evolving. If you go to the next slide, please. So here's an example of disruption. The, uh, there's a couple of interesting things about this particular example. When the, uh, uh, when the Russians went into Georgia a couple of years ago, the, uh, there were a few things on there that were, that were of interest. The first thing is that coincidentally, there was a, uh, a large number of denial of service attacks into the Russian, or into the Georgian Ministry of Defense. And uh, it's, I mean, no one has ever claimed responsibility for that, obviously, and clearly there would be no tie between that and the military activity on the ground, but just suppose that there, it coincidentally happened that way that you saw denial of service attacks that were connected to conventional operations. And so if you think about what that portends, what in my opinion at least, what that does portend is that the future of military activities, conventional military ground maneuver activities, are going to have some kind of cyber play connected, whether tactically or operationally, to, what, to what's happening. And you saw the first time that you saw those things kind of come together. Very um, <clears throat> uh, aggressive attacks against the Ministry of Defense. Um, a lot of it was done by what uh, are referred to as hacktivists. Um, they were patriotic uh, folks and, uh, that, that decided that, that they needed to do something against the country of Georgia. Um, and it, there were uh, websites that were easily available where you could go in there and kind of pick and choose what you wanted to do in terms of disruptive attacks. So, 
But that was the first time that we'd seen that integration and something that I think is, uh, you're gonna probably see more of in the future. Next slide, please. So here's an example. Now this was not caused by malicious behavior, but the way it was caused is, is really interesting to, to, to take a look at. There is these things called SCADA, and you can see that we spell the acronym out there, but a SCADA system is something that controls an electric grid, for example. It controls power in a grid, and it controls about everything that there is in there, how much, uh, how much output there is, how, what the amperage is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, it runs all of those systems. Well, those SCADA systems are manufactured by about a dozen or so, and there's probably three or four major companies in the world that manufacture them. They are all connected into the internet. Why? Because the companies want to be able to push software patches and other things into, the, into these networks so they are connected. Any place there is a connection to the internet is a vulnerability. What happened in this particular case is that there was one of the turbines in this, uh, um, in this power facility was uh, what in, in our parlance would be, uh, it, it had a non-RFI tag hanging on it. It wasn't ready for issue, it wasn't ready to, to, to operate. But the, the controller who was operating the facility remotely didn't realize that. So when they powered this thing up, he powered up the turbine, and the problem was that the reason that the thing was not operable was because the governor on the, uh, center, on the, the uh, turbine itself was inoperative, which meant that the turbine was gonna spin and it was never gonna be governed to a certain RPM. So what happened is they turn the thing on, it starts to spin up, and as it exceeds the limit at which it is supposed to spin, it begins to tumble and turn and then eventually just comes off the rails. And what you see on the right side of the screen there is what happened when all of the blades, these molten hot blades from this turbine blasted out into this facility and uh, there were 72 or three people that were killed in this incident. Now, it's easy enough to see how that kind of a mistake or that kind of an accident could very easily be caused um, by somebody that was being malicious. Because if you had access into the internet, you had access into that SCADA system, it's, it's not beyond the pale to imagine that you could have affected it in the same way. So it's, again, the, the destructive capabilities that are, that either come from software that has that built into it or from the accesses that allow you to get into a system to alter um, the, the controls, if you will, that operate that system is, 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 is one of the things that we are clearly moving towards. And while there may be military applicability for this, it also is a tremendous vulnerability to us uh, in terms of defending our own systems and our own networks. Most of the power systems in this country, almost all of them, are run by SCADA networks, and they're all connected back into, uh, into the internet. So you can just imagine what kind of vulnerabilities potentially are out there. Next slide. So how does Cyber Command, when, when we look at this threat, and when we're told, okay, this is the threat against the dot .mil networks, in our case specifically, how is it that we go about trying to, uh, to, to address this and to sort of set the stage for this thing? So you see the first notion there is that treating cyber as an operational domain, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The, uh, the notion of employing an active defense, you know, as I said before, that, you know, I mean, Lombardi was right, you know, the best defense is a good offense. And, you know, if you, if you look at the, the history of, uh, of, of warfare, it's just absolutely replete with failures of static defenses. So we believe that you can't have a static defense where you just have sensors out there and you wait for things to come into them. That you have to be out in the networks, and the expression that we use is hunting, where you're actually actively going after malware and looking for things that the sensors may have missed or to try to find them before they get to the boundary. And we do that, we can do that on our dot .mil networks, but that is, in our opinion, a part of any defense. The uh, extending protection to the critical infrastructure, this is still being kind of worked, but the, the, the bottom line is that there are critical pieces of our infrastructure that are critical to the national security that need to be robustly defended against, uh, against the kinds of threats that we just talked about. The notion of collective defense goes to uh, what we talked about before with regard to coalitions. You know, there is there is a collective nature of the way we have to defend uh, ourselves uh, in cyberspace, and that just it just bodes for more of that kind of uh, involvement. 
the notion about operationalizing cyber, I'm gonna to talk to that a little bit here in a minute and about how we sort of see, I'm trying to, to, to operationalize it and to demystify it and to put cyber in the terms that, that warfighters and operators would, uh, would uh, be comfortable with. Building a common operational picture. You know, we've been hearing about this COP, this common operational picture for God, as long as I can remember, we're gonna have this, this picture that's gonna, you know, this sort of omniscient view of the battle space. Well, we don't have one of those in cyber right now, and it's got as many technical issues as other issues with trying to bring all these data feeds into one place so that we can actually have visibility over the various things that are occurring in uh, on the net and in cyberspace, not just on the blue side, but the red side and the gray side and every other piece of that thing. And that's a, that is a, a focus of main effort for us right now that uh, to try to build that cyber operational, the common operational picture in our uh, joint operations center up at Fort Meade. Increasing the capacity of the, of the services. We rely on our, obviously, on our service components to build capacity for us to be able to address these cyber threats and the services are working very, very hard at doing that right now and they're increasing the throughput of people and it ranges from folks that are right out of high school that go to uh, right out of boot camp and they go through a series of schools to learn how to operate on the net to kind of drive the mouse and do those kind of technical things. It runs the gamut from those folks to captains and majors that are coming out of postgraduate school with advanced degrees in computer science that, that can help us build tools and, and the kinds of, of technology that we need on the net. So there's a wide variance of the capacity that we need to build and an authorities framework the, the authorities in, in this case are, some of them are, are very clearly delineated, some of them not, not so much so. The, the notion too that if you're gonna respond to, to an attack in, at quote net speed, that you have to have almost sort of prepackaged authorities like you would for an O plan, an operational plan that would allow you to do certain things without having to go back through a chain and request it real time if you could have done that prior to that in order to be able to, to operate at the speed at which we, uh, we think we'd need to to be able to stem some kind of an, of an attack. And you can see the doctrine piece that sort of ties everything together that, uh, that I talked about before. Next slide, please. So in terms of defending against the threat, this is where our focus is today. This is the kind of things that we look at, this notion about defensible systems, hardening existing networks. Some of that is uh, this culture and practices. You know, at the end of the day, the, the entity that is still responsible for most of the issues that we have on the, on the net are, is the, the operators, it's, it's, it's us. You know, whether you're accidentally moving a thumb drive from one side to another, or whether you're intentionally downloading something that you shouldn't be, or, or accessing something that you shouldn't be. So there's a lot of technology that we're putting in place to help mitigate that, but that, and in, the other thing that we talk about when we talk about hardening is simple things like loading the antivirus software, you'd be surprised at how much of that just doesn't happen. And uh, so this uh, sensing and hunting within the networks, we talked about that before, and hunting is a good metaphor for that if you can just imagine being out in the networks looking for malware. Mitigating threats on the boundary and this uh, tipping and queuing in real time, you know, we have a, a, a signals intelligence network that allows us to, to tip and queue, if you will, from other sources into the, to, to load into our sensors to tell us when there are things out there that may be, may be coming our way. And that's a very, very big part of the way we defend. And then this response at network speed uh, is a lot of that is having the authorities, the TTPs in place so that we can respond to it at that sort of speed. So next slide. So what's this thing about maneuvering in a new domain? So I asked, a, the folks to put some slides together and we wanted to talk about the, the relationship or the kind of the, the similarity it has to the air domain. And we, uh, we had a picture in here a couple of days ago of a squadron 251, which happens to be the squadron that I commanded, which also happens to be uh, the, uh, the squadron that, uh, that uh, Tom Wilkerson also commanded. He and I have that in common. But somehow that didn't make the final cut. But the notion was that in the AV, you know, when we started to fly in, in, air, in the air, before we did that, that domain did not have the value to us that it had once we began to operate in the domain. So this, in the same sense that we are operating in cyberspace, it's, it was not a thing before then. It was an entity that didn't really have any value to us. The difference, of course, is that in the domain, you don't change the domain of, of 
land or sea or air by operating in it or on it or with it. But when you operate in cyberspace, you do change the domain. Every time you plug another unit into that thing, you change the, the, the characteristics of the domain in which you operate. And, and that in and of itself is a, is a notion that I don't think that we've completely gotten our heads around about exactly what that means, that we have the ability, if you will, to influence the domain in which we operate um, in a way that we don't with the others. So there are some similarities that do work when you look at cyber and compare it to other domains. But as you can see in the bottom right corner where I think this is evolving to is that it, it's just a different way of thinking about how we affect the atmospherics in which we operate. So uh, if you go to the next slide, please. And as an example of that, so on the top of this slide, you see this notion of the geographic environment. It's a couple of maps, right? So and everybody, that most of the folks in this room have probably some experience with this. So you've got the, the center map up there that talks about uh, you know, the physical space in which we operate. The bottom map there is, uh, and I put that in the other day, to design to, to, to kind of give you a little bit of a sense for the, the regional domain, if you will. You know, the way the combatant commands are, are, are set up today regionally, there's regions of the world in which we, uh, in which a, a combatant commander has, or over which he has purview. Well, cyber, of course, is a domain that doesn't understand geographic boundaries. It, uh, it's a domain that crosses geographic boundaries in, uh, with, with absolute uh, in, impertinence, if you will. You don't know when you launch an email where all those packets are gonna go. You don't know if they're all gonna go from a, in a single file to one place or whether a router's gonna break them up and they're gonna wind up going all over the globe to reassemble somewhere else. So the notion that you can have some sort of geographic sovereignty, whether that sovereignty is nation state sovereignty or that sovereignty has to do with the, with the purview of a regional combatant command, is, a, is, a, uh, is an analogy that begins to, um, it, it begins to, if not completely fall apart, it, it has some vulnerabilities when you begin to apply cyber to it. So there's a couple of things that are, that, that, that are at work here. One is the authorities. So if we look at the authorities that we have in terms of what we do in cyberspace, and those authorities are based on the notion of a geographically sovereign country, then that will be challenging if, in fact, cyberspace doesn't uh, sort of comport with that. And the other part of this is, in terms of the way we've geographically divided the, the globe, the geographical combatant commanders and what they do in cyberspace is, is an area that we are spending a lot of time with them on and trying to ascertain at what level those, those effects, those cyber effects should be regionalized as opposed to, let's say, uh, controlled more globally because of the, of the reach, not just of the effect and what could happen when you do something in cyberspace and that effect could be, could be worldwide in seconds, but in terms of the way you might try to command and control those effects, in, if you had an expectation that you could keep those effects in a particular geographic area, then that might sort of portend towards a more traditional command and control structure but if you were not sure that you could keep those effects in a particular geographic area, then you might want to be thinking about a different way to do this. And, and that may be by geography, maybe. It may be by the type of effect, tactical operation or strategic. There may be some temporal sense of this thing. Maybe we do this by time is how we deconflict this. Um, so we're not quite sure, but we're working our way through that. Next slide. So this is a physical maneuver, okay? What, what I've, the whole notion of maneuvering in cyberspace, I think, has some similarities to what we would refer to as maneuver warfare in terms of the agility and speed that we have to operate at. So what, we're, what I'm trying to do here in the next couple of slides is to sort of lay out the similarities between the two of them in a way to think about it. So if you think about physical maneuver in this more traditional sense, and some of you may even recognize uh, this, this, the, the, the icons on this map and where it's from, if you go to the next slide, please. So, so how does that relate to this? This is a Linux kernel, if you will. Th this is the cyber map. This is not the physical map. So how does maneuver, how do we apply the concept of maneuver into that environment that you're looking at right there? In, 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 in an environment that doesn't have the traditional kind of high ground and 
go and no-go places and things like that that we are used to dealing with in the operational world. Well, maybe it does. Maybe we just have to, maybe that, maybe that analogy will work. We just have to think about it a little different conceptually. So if you go to the next slide. So maybe if you imagine it looks like this. So if you can imagine that that cyber um, environment, if you put that in a three-dimensional sense and you think of it in, the, in terms now of trying to apply the concept of maneuver, of ground maneuver in cyberspace, so instead of going you know, around this particular hill or mountain or coming and doing some big swooping housing into the valley of death up here, perhaps what you're doing in cyberspace is you're going from an IP to an IP to something else. And so it lo what it looks like on a screen is a bunch of green X's and O's and numbers on there, but the person that's sitting behind the screen, it means something different to them. And maybe the visual that he's got in his head is similar to what you see on that screen there. So as a way to conceptualize what we do in, in terms of maneuver, I think that that might be, a, might be an appropriate way for us to think about it. Next slide. So where do we see the future? What are the challenges that are out there? Well, the first thing you see in the middle of the chart is the accelerating rate of change. You know, this uh, Moore's law is in fact alive and well, and we continue to, uh, to, to either reap the benefits or, uh, or not of that. But it is, it's, it's accelerating very quickly. We often talk about riding this uh, winds of change, if you will, instead of trying to fight it. That's a, that's a thing that's pretty easy, much more easily said than done. I don't know if people know how to quote, ride the winds of change, but, uh, but it is accelerating at a tremendous rate. The mobile computing piece that's coming in now, you know, you just saw the big thing the other day that, that was in the news and the open press about the iPhone and about the GPS in the iPhone, and about the fact that, you know, that it, when, you, when you open up your iPhone and you get this little map and it's, you wanna go from here to there and you type something in and it tells you, hey, this is great, and here's where we're going, and you go, wow, this is really cool. Well, it is really cool. The other side of that is, in order to do that, there's a GPS in that, in that phone, and somebody, in fact, knows where, where that phone is. Whether that somebody knows where you are is another thing, but they certainly might know where that phone is. So, as we go into a more mobile computing environment, what does that mean to us in terms of, uh, of security, in terms of um, our networks? Are we gonna get to the point where we can put classified networks into mobile uh, computing? We think so, and we're, we're working on that right now. But, but how mobile computing and how that whole thing evolves and the way we transition from networks and, and systems that are geographic to, tied to brick and mortar places is, is, a, is a dynamic that uh, we continue to look at. This notion of ubiquitous encryption, they had to use one multi-syllabic word in this thing, you know, that AOs can't resist putting a brief together without one. So we got it, it's ubiquitous. The, the, the important thing here is that, that commercial encryption today is very, very good at some of it, and you can, it's readily available. So as encryption becomes more um, available and as it becomes more and more efficient and effective, that has some, some challenges because if you were trying to, if someone was trying to encrypt something so that you couldn't read it, but you were very interested in knowing what was in there for some national security reason, then you might be challenged by the notion that encryption is sort of everywhere. So it's just, it's just a, another thing we find that, uh, you know, and you read this in the open press, that, uh, that the, a lot of the criminal types that are operating on networks are very, very good at encrypting things. The, um, the key terrain and the command and control, that, uh, in, that's just a snapshot from three years ago of all the denial of service attacks that occurred in one, in one year, and it just spread all over the globe, and it's just meant to show you that they're that there were an awful lot of them. They're very, very common, and uh, you've seen recently the issues that Sony's had with their PlayStation, with people getting into those things. I mean, this is just kind of what we're living with right now, so we just have to, I think, internalize the fact that this is not an anomaly anymore. It's just, it's the way things are, and if you think that it is just the way things are, then maybe you'd be tempted to develop defensive measures against that that were more in line with the way things are and the way we do things day to day. I mean, I, you know, we're all guilty of it. You get, every time you get a new software update on your machine, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it takes a while to load it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and especially with the antivirus stuff. So, I mean, it's just little things like that. The, um, the migration ASA thing, not to dwell on it, but um, it, clearly that is where uh, the great uh, majority of the growth in computer expertise is these days. 
And uh, so that, and that does cause, that does, it, there are some challenges associated with that that we just need to kind of think through in the United States because of our size. We're not ever gonna be able to compete capacity-wise, so we are gonna need to continue to develop and to leverage our um, advances in technology. And as you all know, there are, they are many, and we are uh, a very, very advanced technological country. We've got a tremendous capacity for doing that, and I think that that is one of the things we need to do in the future, is to continue to lean harder and harder and more and more on that technical capacity to make up for some of the just general capacity issues that other people are ultimately gonna be able to uh, to uh, uh, transcend or pass us on, so next slide. So, so the last thing, if I could leave you with this, we tried to put everybody's logo that we could on here. Um, we, this really is a, a, a team sport in, in the sense that we talked about at the beginning, that it's a, it's a coalition, it's a joint, the way that we operate, um, this notion of shared situational awareness it, with that comes an obligation to abide by the protocols and the rules of the organization or the network into which you are, are a part and with which you're sharing. This uh, agile tipping and queuing, knowing when things are coming and what's out there. The, the integration of offensive and defensive capabilities, like we said, that, that, is, that is what sort of was the genesis for the birth of Cyber Command. And the, those two things are just inextricably linked in a way that uh, uh, that is, eh, I don't know that we've completely internalized it because for many years we had small pockets of offense and defense around and trying to bring them together and trying to get, uh, to, to get people to think the same way that it's a, fl it's a flow, it's a, it's a spectrum. You don't just defend and then attack, you do them simultaneously. And uh, so, and the last thing about this uh, synchronizing command and control, and again, this is not just across the Department of Defense, it's across the, the allies and, it's, and, it's, um, and, our, and our coalition partners. Again, Cyber Command's role in this thing, we are focused on the dot mil networks, that's our domain, if you will. That's where we have the authorities to operate. And, uh, and so in, in doing that, we obviously reach out to the, uh, to the services, but also to the other folks in, uh, in the U.S. government across the whole of government that have equities in what goes on in the dot mill networks and with, our, uh, and with our, our, uh, our partners as well as we build coalition, more coalition networks in the future and make them defensible so that we can share information so that the regional combatant commanders can conduct war fighting the way they need to across those, those uh, coalition networks but that they are defensible and that, uh, that, we've, that we are able to, uh, with some level of, uh, of confidence, tell them that those networks are in fact uh, secure and defensible. So, at any rate, those are my comments for this morning. I, uh, I hope just to give you a bit of an insight into what we do in Cyber Command and the way we view cyberspace writ large in terms of joint and coalition war fighting. And I don't know if I'm supposed to take questions or, so would you like me to do that, Tom? Okay. Okay, I'm happy to take a question if it's not too hard. We have to. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, my name is Terry Casto. I'm an Intel programs uh, consultant. Uh, I hope the audience uh, uh, absorbed the urgency of the message that I think you gave us this morning. We have a huge vulnerability because of of our whole way of life riding on the, on the IT infrastructure that's so vulnerable to cyber attacks and we have a growing threat across the world with increasing capabilities. Um, if you had three things that you could do if you were in charge of the world, right, what would you do to try to move the ball forward? In my sense is the needle is moving, but it's moving slowly. What would you do to try to accelerate the process to get us to a more secure position than we are now? Well, I think that, uh, so the question was, what would, what would be the things that I would wanna do now to make the networks, uh, to get us to a more secure place? So I think I would probably start with the, this, this notion of, uh, of the, the culture, if you will, the, the culture that surrounds the way we uh, understand security practices, to realize that they're not an annoyance, that they're just what we need to do, that that would be the, the very first thing, I think, that would, that would move us down that road. The, uh, the second thing is the, the way that we, that, we, uh, that we think about the technology that we use to, to, uh, to, to help us defend. 
it seems to me that we can, that we can and we should and we are, uh, uh, at the same time that you build defensible networks and that you're able to defend, you also, that it's not a question of whether you do that and you have to uh, have some issues with privacy. I don't think that's it at all. And I think that you can, you can retain the sense of privacy that we have and, and, the, uh, and, and, and personal freedoms in the United States and still have a defensible network. I think the technology is out there that allows us to do that. And the last piece would probably be to have us take a look at the authorities that we have to operate in cyberspace and, uh, and the way that, that we look at um, the adversaries realizing that there is a time uh, issue here that uh, to, in order for us to operate against some sort of an intrusion that is, uh, it, it, even though our decision cycle, depending on where you are down here, you know, in a squadron, it might run in hours. In Washington, it might run in days or weeks. But the decision cycle is is not right now um, at the same pace that the issues are with the intrusions in the network. So I think that that's probably would be the last thing that I would uh, probably take a look at. That's a great question. Thanks. Uh, building on the authorities question, uh, Lynn Wells, National Defense University. Uh, some have talked about defense support of civil authorities or related types of authorities to allow uh, Cyber Command, NSA to support uh, uh, the Department of Homeland Security and other whole of government, whole of nation approaches. What do you see as the authorities' issues in this uh, whole of government approach right now? Well, thanks for the question, Len. I knew you'd ask me something that was hard. Um, Okay, so we, uh, we are working very closely with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, who has the, uh, the um, mission to protect the .gov and networks uh, here in the United States, and, uh, and we are working very closely with them to try to understand where, there's a, where the line, if there is a line, between what we do to support them and what they do in terms of reacting to, uh, to events. And so we... We have, what we are trying to do with them right now with the, with the Department of Homeland Security is to work on the, the, the uh, sort of the, the, um, the TTP kind of things, the sort of the concepts about how we're going to operate together prior to something happening, which is I think where we, uh, we want to focus. We want to be able to, to get out in front of uh, a threat, if you will, or a potential threat in a way that, that would mitigate us having to sort of deal with a cleanup in aisle nine after it's already happened. Because the, the issues with cyberspace is that unlike a sort of a more traditional disaster, if you will, you know, the, a hurricane, the levee breaks, et cetera, we react to that. Well, if you had an incident in cyber that was, uh, that, that, for instance, maybe affected all of the financial networks or all of the electrical networks, it's much more difficult to go in there and try to clean that up after the fact. So um, uh, we are, in fact, moving that ball downrange. As a matter of fact, when I get back this afternoon, we have a series of meetings on, on where we're going with that, with us and DHS in terms of the MOU. So. It's a great question, and it is clearly one that, uh, that is of great importance to the nation that we leverage the capabilities that we have with all of the, of the, of the whole of government to be able to react to, uh, to a cyber event or to mitigate it, keep it from ever happening. So easier said than done, but we're working on it. So. Uh, greetings, General. My name is Jeffrey Damon Capella. I'm a U.S. Army veteran, attendee of Georgetown University, and a graduate of Syracuse University. I just wanted to first thank you for extending us here at this conference, the courtesy of your time. I know you must be very busy. That said, I wanted to touch upon one of the issues you brought up, which is the collective relationship or collective security approaches that we're trying to adopt. In that, the two questions, well, I got kind of a two-part question. One, what anticipatory strategies do you foresee being included to insulate such collective endeavors from the pitfalls that undermine collective approaches traditionally, which is like, examples to include the prisoner dilemma, state or non-state spoiler free rider issue. And two, in the mitigation to Asia issue, what anticipatory strategies do you foresee would be desirable to insulate against, say, increased dis insider threats with the United States being dependent upon more foreign sources of human capita? Okay, um, I'll take the second one first, which had to do with the, uh, the migration to uh, Asia and the, and the issue of insider threats and what we, uh, and what we would uh, propose to, uh, to, to do to mitigate that. Um, 
so there's a lot of technical things that we are doing now with our networks, with the dot .mil networks, things that we're loading in those networks that will tell us uh, instantly about activity in that network that is not judged to be the kind of activity that we want to occur on those networks. In other words, people that are do doing things they shouldn't be doing, whether they're downloading things or otherwise. So there's some of the, of the technology, and as I mentioned before, we, we're leaning very heavily in that direction because in many ways, the, in order for us to sort of to have the kind of reach and scope across our DOD networks that we need, we have to have the technology there to do a lot of machine-to-machine -machine kind of queuing and tipping of the, of the, the, the threat that's out there. The, the first question, if I, if I got what you were asking me, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, you were trying to understand what we saw as the vulnerabilities in terms of trying to build these cooperative networks and bringing people in them. I mean, it's a great question, and you're, you're, you're into the heart of this whole thing, which is, if you're going to share that kind of information with other people, it's going to, is there a vulnerability? You bet there is. So I, I think that maybe the way to go about doing this is to say, if you want to join this network, if you want this information, then you're going to have to abide by these standards of conduct. And perhaps, as people realize just how important it is for them to have access to that kind of information, and to be part of that, you may be able to change the behavior of, of some folks that wouldn't be so inclined, which is not to say that Ronald Reagan was wrong, um, but uh, you know, you, you can trust but verify at the end of the day is probably a good way for us to, to, to look at that. So, thank you. Okay, one uh, more morning. question they tell me. Just one last question, it's Paulo Amaral, I'm the, from the Portuguese um, FCA chapter. Um, I have a doctrine question, which is the following. Um, our enemies will develop technology to attack us that we not, do not know about. Um, wouldn't it make, make sense to include strong ties in the doctrine that is being developed um, to the intelligence community? Hmm. Um, okay, let me see if I understood what you were just asking me. You were, you were asking me about about doctrine and about the intelligence community, and specifically, I see that it's difficult for me to hear among the, the din in the background. Can you run it by me again? <clears throat> the idea is the following. Um, our enemies are developing these new, new technologies, and we may know about the, the way we can attack by developing offense, offense um, operations, of course, but um, they may, came up with new things that we do not really know about. Um, and the intelligence community may be able to be more effective learning on what they are really doing to attack us before they do, because the zero day exploits and zero day attacks are okay. really, really uh, dangerous. Okay, uh, okay, I think I got it now. What, uh, and I, I think your point is a great one. If I understood it, you were saying that we, we really need to make sure we leverage the intelligence community and what they have to offer. And that is exactly why United States Cyber Command is co-located with NSA. And it's exactly why we have a shared common commander between NSA and Cyber Command, so that we can, in fact, leverage what the intelligence community knows about the threat, about what's out there, about what's coming, in a way that, that, is, that is timely and real time, so that we can be able to either A, react or mitigate that threat. So it's, it's an excellent, excellent question. And, and it clearly is, you know, if you saw everything I was talking about this morning was really all about intelligence-driven operations. I mean, this is, they, those two things are becoming more and more, those two disciplines are coming together more and more, especially in the world of cyber, and it's sometimes difficult to tell one from the other. Uh, a lot of the, the officers and general officers on my staff are intelligence officers at Cyber Command, that, but bring with them that breadth of operational knowledge. So it's a great question. Thank you very much.